Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to visit here again uh, after well eight years. That's a long time. Uh, so as uh, we said, I actually I mostly work on protoplanetary disk planet formation, but this is a new field that I'm convinced that it's very promising. And so I started to work on in the past few years. It has to do with the uh, cosmic ray uh, feedback. And I hope I can convince you that this is really a very exciting field that to be opened up. Uh, and uh, the content of this talk can be uh, a bit technical, especially have to do with a lot of uh, microphysics. Uh, but since this is theta, uh, I guess it's okay. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, so cosmic rays, uh, we know they are an important uh, ingredient of the uh, interstellar medium. And this is a spectrum that we, energy spectrum that we observe from the Earth. They are mostly a power law, okay, with a power law uh, index of 2.7. And most of the particles are GeV particles. So these are mildly relativistic, uh, mostly protons. Uh, the interesting fact is that they are, their energy density, okay, of about one EV per cc is actually comparable to the, uh, the general say, thermal energy content, magnetic energy content uh, of the ISM. So that means they are uh, dynamically important. Uh, and for our, uh, for our purpose to understand the feedback, okay, and the microphysics of the feedback, uh, one important thing to bear in mind is to look at, say, the gyro radius of a typical cosmic ray particle of GeV protons. And you figure that for GeV particle gyrating in a, say, micro Gauss magnetic field, the gyro radius is about 10 to minus 6 parsecs. That's basically AU scale. And so that's also the scale where most of this microphysics is taking place. And so this is absolutely tiny compared with the overall scale of the ISM. So it's important uh, to bear in mind. All right, so here's the outline. So to study uh, so feedback, so the first thing you want to understand is how cosmic rays are coupled uh, with the background thermal plasma, basically the, the ISM. Okay. And, and what's the consequence of this? And then uh, I will pre present a uh, numerical method that we recently uh, developed called MHD particle in cell, uh, or MHD peak, which has unique advantages to study such microphysical uh, uh, aspects of the feedback. And in particular, then I'll present studies of the so-called cosmic ray streaming stability, which is uh, sort of the key uh, physics underlying uh, that microphysics. And, uh, uh, and of course, this is just the beginning, and I will then uh, discuss about uh, various future directions. All right, so cosmic ray, so before we understand it as a, uh, uh, to, to talk about feedback, we start uh, to consider them as a test particles. And this is usually how people study the transport of cosmic rays, say, in the, in, in the uh, ISM. Uh, first of all, they are essentially collisionless. If you talk about the Coulomb cross-section with other uh, protons, for instance, uh, this is absolutely tiny, okay, something like this. And if you talk about the mean free pass, uh, it's 10 to 30 centimeters. That means that you have about one chance to collide with another nucleus uh, in a Hubble time. So this, they are absolutely collisionless uh, uh, for our purpose. And uh, so what they do is that they just gyrate around magnetic field uh, in the interstellar medium. But we know that the magnetic field in, in the ISM is not necessarily straight, okay, so they are irregularities or due to waves and turbulence present uh, in the ISM. And so this will make co uh, cosmic ray particles to diffuse, okay, by scattering of this. These are typically resonant interactions. Basically, when you gyrate for one orbit, you travel about a wavelength. Okay, those interactions can give you a, <coughs> a pitch angle scattering and eventually scatter the cosmic rays. Uh, and based on the cosmic ray data, we can infer that typically uh, cosmic ray particles stay in the galaxy for about uh, tens of uh, million years, okay? And uh, if you turn that into a diffusion coefficient, basically the size of the system divided by this residence time, you get a number of something like 10 to the 28 uh, CGS. That's a typical number that people use, okay, when study overall uh, cosmic ray transport. Uh, there is, yeah, there is energy dependence, of course, but this is a typical, for a typical GeV kind of particles, yeah. Uh, and so where is this uh, scattering coming from? They come from, say, turbulence, and we know that uh, the ISM is highly turbulent, and there is this famous uh, big power law, uh, basically showing the uh, turbulent energy spectrum uh, as a function of uh, wavelengths. They are measured by a, a range of uh, techniques, and it well, uh, has been well known since the uh, 1990s. 
And basically, turbulence, uh, their energy is mostly contained at large scales or, or injection scales. Those are typically above uh, hundreds of parsecs. And eventually, the, the turbulent energy eventually cascades to a smaller and smaller scale. And this is a very extended parallel all the way from parsec, hundreds of parsec scales down to very much, much smaller scales. Um, and this interaction, okay, turbulent scattering of cosmic rays is, of course, most effective, okay, when they are particle gyre radius matches the turbulence scale. And so because most of the energy is containing the large scale, that means scattering of cosmic rays is most, most effective for those with much larger gyre radius. Uh, and again, if you plug in some numbers, right, if you want to talk about the parsec scale, uh, for parsec scale, I mean the corresponding cosmic ray energy is something like 10 to the 15 EV, which is much larger than the typical GeV particles. That means uh, in fact, people, people uh, uh, realize that uh, the scattering of most GeV particles is unlikely dominated by this, okay? Only at energies, say, above uh, about 20 GeV. That's where the particles that they are efficiently scattered by interstellar medium turbulence. So for, for typical GeV energy particles, you need something else, okay? And that is related to the dynamical role uh, played by cosmic rays. So what are the dynamical role played by cosmic rays? So first of all, uh, if you treat the, uh, consider cosmic ray particles as a whole, uh, we know that they are, well, cosmic ray pressure is comparable to thermal pressure, comparable to magnetic pressure in the ISN. Uh, and uh, the Im immediate implication uh, is that, well, they can provide pressure support. support. Uh, and uh, if you go it, uh, do it more carefully, actually, this pressure support is only perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, along the magnetic field for cosmic rays can freely uh, travel. Uh, so this is one thing. However, although you think that cosmic rays can uh, freely travel along the magnetic field, it, it turns out it doesn't do so very easily. It turns out that if cosmic rays are streaming through this background plasma faster than the so-called affine speed, okay, I'm not talking about individual particles, but cosmic rays as a whole. There are particles traveling forward, backward, but if you're t taking them as a whole, the bulk drift speed, if that exceeds the uh, background alphane velocity, which is this, okay, it turns out that they can make alphane waves unstable, and this is called the cosmic ray streaming instability. That has been known since the late, uh, almost 50 years ago, all right. And what's the consequences of, uh, of uh, all this feedback, okay, all this cosmic ray streaming instability? So the first important uh, concept is the cosmic ray self-confinement. Okay, as I said, okay, if when they are streaming along uh, the magnetic faster than the alphane uh, speed, they will uh, excite alphane waves, okay, they grow. As they grow to larger and larger amplitude, they start to scatter the cosmic rays, right? They, they, you, you have now a lot of uh, magnetic turbulence. Now you st start to scatter cosmic rays and prevent them from streaming as, uh, as fast as uh, they want. And eventually, this will try to isotropize the cosmic ray distribution in the, way, in the frame of the alphane waves uh, in this wave, and thus reduce the CR streaming. So without this instability, CR just, cosmic rays can just escape at speed of light. Now it's saying that you can at most escape at about alphane speed. Okay, so there's significant reduction. And uh, in other words, basically cosmic rays are trapped okay, by the wave that they created by themselves. And so this is, gives you the concept of cosmic ray self-confinement. And uh, in parallel to this, uh, you can, there is cosmic ray driven outflows. Uh, there are several ways you can do it. Um, uh, the easiest thing is to, okay, well, cosmic ray has a pressure gradient that can give you a force that push, uh, pushes outward. And moreover, this cosmic ray streaming instability, okay, the process, you excite the wave and the waves can exchange uh, momentum and energy with the cosmic ray particles, this will further, okay, give, it, uh, give the background gas a boost, which can help uh, drive out flows. And moreover, this process will also uh, give you uh, heating, and there, uh, again, when you heat the gas, um, it can potentially push things out. And so overall, all these processes are known to be important feedback me mechanisms for galaxy evolution, for formation and evolution. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar uh, with MHC, okay, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, uh, just to give you some little bit of background, okay, what MHC is. Well, I assume everyone knows hydrodynamics. MHC is just hydrodynamics plus magnetic field, and the magnetic field is frozen in 
to the fluid because the gas is well ionized. And the, only, the main new addition where you have magnetic field is the, uh, now you have the Lorentz force, okay, uh, which is J cross B. And so what this Lorentz force does, okay, uh, to understand how Lorentz, uh, Lorentz force does, uh, what Lorentz force does, we can decompose it into uh, various components. This is a nominal decomposition and into two uh, components. This is called magnetic pressure because it looks like a pressure gradient. And it's called magnetic tension. Well, but we know that Lorentz force is always perpendicular to B, right? But this form is it's not obvious from this form. So actually, it's more intuitive uh, to rewrite this into uh, two analogous terms, where now here, you only have pressure exerted in the perpendicular direction. And this term becomes this, where this kappa is basically the curvature, it pointing to the uh, direction where the field lines bend. And so, and it's more easily look uh, to, to, uh, to be seen from this uh, cartoon. Okay, so this basically, if you have magnetic field that is, uh, you have more compressed, then they try to uh, uh, resist uh, to the opposite direction. And for this magnetic tension, it basically states that magnetic field doesn't want to be bent. Okay, it tends to straighten. If you bend it, it tries to, tries to resist, resist, and that gives you this force of magnetic tension. Uh, I don't think so. It, it is first order. It is first order. <coughs> yeah. Um, and equivalently, you can think of magnetic field lines just as a string. Okay, that is has tension on it. All right. So once you have magnetic field, okay, what it does to uh, the waves in the system, right? Without magnetic field, we know there are sound waves, which is a, 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 a compressible wave, and the restoring force is pressure. And when you have magnetic field, okay. The, because of magnetic pressure, okay, now you can contribute uh, uh, this split into fast and slow magnetosonic modes, depending on the phase, etc. Uh, but what's the really new addition when you have magnetic field is the presence of so-called Alfin waves. This is unique to MHD. Uh, and here, the restoring force is magnetic uh, tension. And the way it works is just like a string. Okay, when you have a string, okay, you know when you have, a, say, a violin, you have a string and you pluck it, it's produce a sound, it produce vibration, and basically produce a wave that propagates out. Um, and the, uh, the wave speed actually here is exactly analogous to the uh, string vibration equation where you can get this, uh, the speed of the wave, where uh, here B is analogous to tension, and here rho is analogous to inertia. Okay, so that's exactly analogous to uh, string vibration. So this is a unique aspect when you have magnetic field in, in the fluid. And this is called Alfin wave, it's just in honor of the uh, person who discovered it, who later got a Nobel Prize. All right, so, uh, this Alfin wave is a, is a transverse wave, so it can have the left and right polarization. You can either do it linear polarization, but it's more intuitive to, uh, <coughs> to decompose that into left and right circular polarization. Um, once you have circular polarization, then they can potentially resonantly interact with cosmic particles, okay? Uh, <coughs> So a resonance happens uh, when the two conditions are satisfied. One is that as it cosmically gyrates for one orbit, it also travels one wavelength. Okay, that's one condition. And moreover, the sense of gyration must match the pattern of, polar, uh, of this wave polarization. Uh, because I mean, like, like for protons, uh, basically it's a left-handed uh, uh, gyration. And if you are Say if you are uh, forward traveling, okay, you're traveling in this direction, uh, and it will be resonant, uh, resonant with left polarized uh, uh, alphane waves, okay, according to this left-handed rule. If they are traveling to the backward direction, then it will be resonant with right polarized alphane waves, okay. So, and moreover, uh, because we are talking about particles traveling at speed of light, okay, and those are. Uh, uh, much, uh, the uh, gyro frequency is much, much larger than the wave frequency in general, so that you can drop this. And so this is, you can essentially consider the waves as static. Okay, the wave is not moving, because C is much larger than V A. So the waves are more or less static, and you have cosmic rays traveling in the background uh, of this alpha wave, so that's a resonant condition. All right, <clears throat> so now let me try to, this is the most, uh, I would say, this is probably the most technical part of this talk try to explain how this cosmic ray streaming instability work. Okay, just based on graphics, all right. Um, so this Alfin wave has a very, uh, okay, I should have, yes, I should have this. This Alfin wave have a very important property that 
the, uh, there are also, okay, whenever you have motion, okay, there's also electric field associated with this motional, called motional electric field. Uh, but in the case of our thin wave, it turns out that electric field will vanish. Okay? It vanishes in the wave frame. Okay. okay, this means because only electric field can do work, right? Magnetic field doesn't do work. This means if you are in the uh, our thin wave frame, then the energy of the particles should be conserved. Okay, because magnetic field does no work, only electric field can do. Okay, so now <coughs> let's consider a situation uh, where, okay, so now I'm plotting the uh, momentum play, uh, space, okay, of the uh, particle distribution. Let's say we, we consider uh, a situation where you have a distribution function, okay, the cosmic rays are described by a distribution function f, and this f, okay, this distribution function is isotropic in a frame that drifts at velocity vd, okay. Uh, and so that means this f is constant along this circle, okay? All right. Now, when you have alphane waves, okay, when the particles are scattered by alphane waves, let's say, let's just take this particle, okay, at this part, as an example. Um, whenever, when, okay, when you are scattering with the waves, what happens is that uh, its energy has to be conserved in the wave frame, okay? Uh, when that happens, that means it can only, okay, due to wave scattering, it can only move along this dashed circle centered on this alphane speed. Okay. Now, um, sorry? Drift, drift velocity. VD is the drift velocity of the, uh, or basically the streaming velocity of the bulk, bulk. yeah, of the bulk cosmic ray population. Yes. And uh, now, Suppose you have a spectrum of waves, right? They just randomly scatter the particles. And this will cause diffusion. And diff what this does is that it, it will try to eventually make the particle distribution sort of isotropic along the dashed circle. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's how pitch angle scattering, all this diffusion, cross linear diffusion works. However, uh, now we have that F. Usually, okay, when you have a cosmic, you have more low energy particles than high energy particles, right? So F is always smaller outside of this blue circle and they are larger inside of this blue circle. That means along this dashed black circle, you have more particles at lower energies and more particles at higher energies. And so this cross linear diffusion will eventually try to basically smear the, the, this gradient of F along this dashed circle it eventually tries to make this dashed circle all constant. So that will be, there will be more particles will moving from right to left than from left to right. Okay, this is a diffusion process. Since more particles are moving from left to right than from left to right, that means these particles will give energy, sorry, give momentum to the waves. And these waves contain, okay, these waves are all positive uh, and give, okay, that means the wave will gain momentum and hence gain amplitude. Okay. Yes, these waves are forward propagating, yes. The, the yeah. wave uh, uh, group speed is along the parallel direction. Yes, 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 yeah. Right, so, so this sort of explains how it works. And, and you only excite waves that, okay, these are all forward traveling particles, and so they excite left polarized alpha waves. Um, and you can f do the same thing considering backward traveling particles. And again, uh, for just picking up particles at this location, and they will uh, be scattered along this dashed circle, right? And here, F is larger here, and F is smaller here. And again, you're giving, and okay, more particles are moving from here, from right to left, than from left to right. Again, they are giving momentum to forward traveling waves. So uh, this will excite right polarized alpha waves. So in the end, what happens is that when the cosmic ray drift velocity exceeds VA, so forward traveling particles excite right polarized forward traveling waves. Backward traveling particles will excite left polarized, again, forward traveling waves, whereas backward propagating waves are suppressed. So that's the basic uh, microphysical result of this instability. And you can further, uh, going through the derivation, you find the uh, characteristic growth rate uh, it scales as the, uh, this is a, a cyclotron frequency of the particles, and uh, it's proportional to the uh, NCR over NI, the ratio of number, uh, cosmic rays to background ion, 
but only particle that satisfy that resonant condition for this wave mode, okay, for this wavelet. And that is also proportional to how much faster you are drifting relative to the alpha wave speed. Okay. And because we mostly we are the, the cosmic populations are dominated by low energy particles, that means uh, <coughs> these these waves are pri primarily the fastest growing mode are driven by the low energy cosmic rays. And here is a distribution uh, is a dispersion relation. If you take if you take a truncated power law distribution, let's say particle energy from P0 to some P max, uh, which is much larger than P0. And here's the, uh, the growth rate, okay, growth rate as a function of wavelengths. Uh, these are, I'm just taking some different uh, parameters. So the fastest growth, uh, gro growing mode corresponding to uh, the wavelengths that are resonant with particles at P0, because these are where most of the particles are. And then it drops on both sides at the power law. All right, uh, and actually, if you increase this NCR over NI, um, there will be uh, another mode actually will pump up, which is the uh, a non-resonant mode that's called Bell instability, which is a different story. But here you can see basically you have a, a solid line and dashed line that corresponds to left and right polarized alpha waves. And the more realistic situation actually in ISM NCR over NI is 10 to minus nine. All right. And in that case, both left and right mode, handed modes grow at the same rate. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so here, okay, it's what people do, okay, people doing, uh, say, galaxy formation simulations, how they deal with cosmic rays. Uh, they start, so these are, we are talking about cosmic rays at feedback, feedback at macroscopic scales. So their starting point is usually this cosmic ray transport equation derived in the, back in the, in the 70s. And they have taken into account several uh, terms. This corresponds to evaction and streaming, where the VST is at VD, okay, in, the, in, in my linear analysis. Uh, they can take into account anisotropic diffusion. Uh, and then this is the adiabatic term. Uh, usually, uh, when doing this, you assume that the streaming speed is, is VA. Um, and of course, you are not really solving the, uh, <laughs> the distribution function. What people really uh, generally do is take moments, okay, of this equation and arrive at a cosmic ray energy equation. Uh, you have, again, all these terms are reflected in this energy equation, including, like, uh, so this term corresponds to cosmic ray heating. And this flux, okay, uh, is composed of several, two terms. One, take into account cosmic ray advection and streaming, and the other cosmic, uh, from cosmic ray diffusion. So that's generally the equation that most people solve when they are doing galaxy formation simulations where they incorporate uh, cosmic rays. But here, there are, there are clearly questions, right? When you do the simulations, what do you do for the streaming speed? Okay, you can, do it, you can take it as VA, but if there's additional process that damp the uh, streaming instability, then cosmic rays should be able to eventually say, enter the free streaming speed, right? That's also possible if you are, this instability doesn't work. And also, what's the diffusion coefficient, okay? Uh, when you're implementing this diffusion. At, at the moment, everything is free, okay? You can f freely just uh, choose your own, your favorite parameters, and so they, they bear a lot of uncertainties. Uh, I understand with streaming, uh, with this uh, kit that I was talking about, you have isotropic copyright distribution. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly a free parameter, right, in this kind of simulations. Okay, in cosmological, yes, in, in galaxy formation simulation, the VD, for instance, is a free parameter. Okay, you can freely choose it. So you uh, said it's because of pressure gradient, so you have a VD. Yes, eventually, what's the streaming speed should be self consistently determined from the microphysics. Mm -hmm. But when you don't know the microphysics, that's a free parameter. Okay. So you expect to have a systematic bulk velocity? Yes. Yeah. Um, Why should I do that? The uh, well, well, in reality, well, you produce cosmic rays from the say the mid-plane region of the ISM, and eventually they want to escape. And that's what you mean by here. So it's a pressure gradient. Yeah, there's a pressure gradient, and that will okay. That pressure gradient will basically convert into a streaming velocity eventually. Yeah. What does it mean? The pressure of the cosmic rays is that dominated by your Lorentz factor 200 GeV particles, or what's the dominance? 
Um, the, the dominant population is the GEV, the low energy. One GEV. Yes, r roughly, okay, GEV scale. Um, because you have, well, you, you have a steep energy spectrum. And so it's mainly the lowest particles in the lowest energy end. Those are the dominant in both number and also actually pressure, okay, contribution to pressure. GEV also the solar, solar wind GEV? Yes, I, in principle, yes. It, it may make sense to even lower energies, but we don't know that much. We don't know those yeah. particles. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I think Voyager has some, has some result. Maybe the peak is uh, 0.1 GeV-ish. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's after solar modulation, yes, modulation from solar. Yes, yes, so actually we don't know much about that yet. Okay, yeah. so, so would this be like just anywhere in the ISF or would it be closer to the source of this or um, <coughs> So, so far, the discussion here is general, okay? okay? But when you are really doing cosmological or galaxy formation simulations, you generally, you have to inject cosmic rays somewhere from some sources, and then follow their evolution, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, okay, so now, there, in the recent years, there's a resurgence of uh, studying cosmic ray-driven outflows, cosmic ray feedback, and dating, okay, their, their, uh, well, analytical work has existed many uh, tens of years ago, but in terms of simulations, in the recent years, many groups have now uh, working hard to incorporate cosmic rays and to get it work. And uh, this is just an example that when, whenever you add in cosmic rays with whatever prescription you easily, in general, what, with whatever uh, prescription you easily get wind, okay? But the, the thing is, uh, the, uh, the properties of the wind are very sensitive to how you prescribe. Uh, the, the cosmic rays. So let's look at this equation again, at, uh, uh, but from a more uh, microphysical perspective. So the underlying assumption behind this equation is that you already assumed that cosmic rays relaxes to an isotropic distribution in this streaming frame, basically, in, in this frame. So you are already assume F is isotropic in this frame. Um, I would say this is likely true. Um, but there can be caveats, okay, uh, as well. Speed of light, no, streaming is uh, affine speed, that's what they affine. assume, yes. So this is the bulk speed. There are particles moving faster now, uh, traveling forward and backward, but on average, if you average them all over the distribution function, they have a systematic bulk velocity. Uh, and if you believe streaming stability works, then uh, this bulk velocity should be the affine speed. Yeah. But less than is not stable anymore. That's right. But there yeah. could be other processes besides just that one. Uh, okay. And then there are additional uh, physics. I mean, the diffusion, okay, instead of taking this magic 10 to the 28 CGS, in reality, those GeV particles, they are likely diffused due to the waves generated by themselves, okay, by a quasi linear diffusion process. Uh, the streaming, whether you really can stream uh, at speed of uh, affine speed or maybe you can stream faster, depending on you have to balance wave growth and wave damping. Uh, and there are also cosmic ray heating, and actually this is not uh, a direct heating. Uh, basically, this instability is an irreversible process which excites a wave, and wave damping gives you the heating. And all these are underlying microphysical processes that you, you really want to understand before you go into uh, macroscopic simulations. All right. And a low spinning speed, meaning that you've got roughly the same number of particles going in both directions, like with a mach the minus four imbalance of left to right. So I should think of I've got regions that generate cosmic waves, let's say a supernova remnant, mm -hmm. and particles stream out initially at some high speed. And then presumably the typical particle turns around such that you meet your streaming speed is very low because most of the particles in any given point have come from both directions because of the outgoing ones have turned around and come back, presumably, right? Mm -hmm. and what causes them to turn around? Bottles? Mills? You basically you rely on this kind of instability, yes. Okay, if you start from an idealized problem where, say, you have all cosmic rays in one place and it's empty elsewhere, 
then eventually, of course, you have to allow some particles to escape, to freely escape, and, but these particles will excite waves. And, the, and these waves will block the rest part of the particles from escaping. Okay, that's gonna be what's happening. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, yes, yes. There are there are yeah, there are also current driven instabilities. Actually, this branch is actually the non resonant branch is currently is current driven, okay, due to streaming current. All right. Um, okay. Now uh, let's move to the next part. Okay, we're gonna talk about how do we study, uh, tackle this problem uh, numerically. And so conventionally, if, we, if when, when you want to study plasma physics from first principles, you are using a method called particle in cell. You are essentially solving everything uh, from first principle. Uh, basically, you have, okay, you, you, want, you, you solve the Maxwell equations on a mesh, okay? And, but, okay, so here are the Maxwell equations. But then you have to supply current, okay? Where is current coming from? This come, come from par particles. So what you do is that you, so, you, you inject all, a bunch of particles, you in, uh, integrate their trajectories. The particle trajectory follows electric and magnetic field. Uh, okay, so that's the first thing you do. Once you integrate them for one step, okay, you can, uh, based on particle motion, you can calculate the current, and then you de de uh, deposit the current into the grid. Okay, into the, and then you solve Maxwell equation with the current supplied from the particles. And after you update the electromagnetic field, okay, then you interpolate them to the location of the particles and you, okay, you close the loop, you just keep, keep moving. So this is the uh, most uh, self-consistent ab initio uh, plasma physics simulation method that has been very widely used, which is great. But there's also a downside. If you really want to do streaming, it's totally a problem. Uh, you find there's, it's very difficult because, I, in fact, so far there's no prior simulation of CR uh, streaming instability at microscopic level at all. And the main reason is that although peak code is great, uh, it gives you everything. Uh, many things that are, you don't need. For instance, you, it can re resolve the propagation of electromagnetic waves, uh, plasma oscillations, and all of Dubai shielding, all these kind of things on a tiny, tiny scale that are irrelevant to this problem. Uh, and basically, there are several flavors of peak. There is one called full peak, where you treat all particles, including uh, background particles. If you are do doing CR, you also have CRs. Background electron and ions, okay, they are all treated as particles. And in that case, you have to resolve this, the so-called electron skin depth. And in ISM context, that's something like five kilometers, okay, <laughs> this whole place. And there's a, Another version called hybrid peak where you treat ions as particles, whereas electrons as massless fluid. There you have to resolve so-called ion skin, skin depths, which is in the ISM is about 200 kilometers. But here, for this cosmic ray streaming instability, you just, the most, the, the, the scale you want to, you're interested in is the gyro radius of cosmic ray, that's something 10 to seven kilometers, which is, there's a huge scale separation here. Uh, <clears throat> so, Noting of this, that we've realized, I mean, since the physics of the cosmic streaming instability, we only need this scale, this motivated us to develop a method that we, well, we just treat the background plasma as a whole, both thermal and, okay, uh, thermal electrons and, and, and ions. We treat them as a whole by a fluid, as a fluid des described by MHD. And we only treat cosmic rays as particles. And in this case, we completely get rid of the uh, tiny plasma scale that you have to resolve by a normal peak. Uh, but we, you, you just have to focus on uh, cosmic ray gyration. And so this method we call MHD peak. And the goal is to clarify uh, the physics of cosmic ray feedback at such microscopic scale. And also eventually, after we sufficiently clarify this microphysics, we want to provide subgrid models for people doing macroscopic uh, simulations. And this is essentially how it works. We have MHD cells where you, have, you define MHD quantities, rho, V, magnetic field. And then you throw in particles which can travel uh, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the grid. And each particle, uh, similar to peak, they are called super particle because they rep really represent a collection, a cloud of particles with the same properties. Uh, and then, well, essentially, each particle carries some effective shape to facilitate uh, interpolation, right? You are 
I mean, like the uh, the, uh, the weight depends on the, the the area. Okay, overlap between this part of the uh, particle shape and the uh, uh, the grid cell, or MHD grid cell, and then you just integrate cosmic ray trajectories. Okay. Uh, under the uh, electric and magnetic fields that you can obtain from MHD. Uh, and uh, the important thing is that you have to do feedback, okay, so that the total energy is conserved and the total momentum is, is conserved. So that's how, uh, how it works. So here are the equations. You are solving particle trajectories for particles. And uh, for MHD, you are solving the same MHD equations except that you just put in feedback. And the feedback the form of the feedback is such that the total energy and total momentum should conserve. All right. And this has been implemented uh, to the Athena MHD code, uh, uh, where, uh, which is described in my 2015 paper. And the, uh, originally, when I uh, developed this code, uh, the first thing we tried is to study particle acceleration uh, in non-relativistic shocks. This has been done many times before uh, using peak code, but here is just a sort of demonstration about the uh, performance of this code. So this is Mach 30, outstanding Mach number 30 parallel shock, meaning background field is you have a background magnetic field uh, parallel to the uh, direction of the flow. Uh, and basically we are just colliding a very rapidly moving flow into a wall, and this will launch a shock that propagates to the right. Uh, so top panel is density and bottom panel, panel is magnetic field. Uh, and actually, in this case, you, you uh, in the upstream region, you actually trigger the so-called Bell instability, which is a non-resonant version of the streaming instability. <coughs> and the, with typical characteristics of this uh, structure that eventually become a, you, you find holes, et cetera. Um, <coughs> and in, the, in this process, uh, okay, just in comparison, right, we are using in this simulation 12 ion skin depths per cell as opposed to 0.5 uh, in hybrid peaks. So typical hybrid peak simulation, their box size is about this big. Okay. We are doing a much, much bigger box, yet we are using a much smaller amount of time. This is, I run this on my desktop, basically, whereas peak, you have to burn uh, thousands of computer CPU hours. Yes, yes. We, uh, for instance, this is the uh, uh, <coughs> evolution of the uh, particle energy spectrum. Since these are non-relativistic shocks for non-relativistic particles, so the ex expected uh, uh, spectrum should be e to the uh, minus uh, three halves, and we exactly get that, and this spectrum extends to higher and higher energies over time. So everything actually, we, we made the comparison and they agree very, much, very well. The main way we give up is particle injection. Uh, we cannot do injection self-consistently. So you have to just put them in by hand. Yes, so th this we have to calibrate using peak and then we inject yeah. by hand, yeah. <laughs> this is 2D. 2D simulation. Yeah, right. 3D, I still need a cluster, <laughs> yeah. All right, <clears throat> now we're talking, let's... Uh, um, I've done some tests, but uh, not really published, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so finally let's talk about using this method to study the streaming instability. So even we have this method, actually it turns out there are several challenges. Okay, so th the first challenge, well, this is not really for this method, it's just compared to the normal peak. Uh, I mentioned before that there's already huge scale separation. If you were to do with a hybrid peak, you have to resolve the ion skin depths. And uh, whereas the uh, Cosmere uh, resonant wavelengths is much larger, and if you compare these two, you find the scale is about, the ratio is C over VA, so right. Uh, and, uh, we, sorry? What kind of values of C over VA? Uh, in the, okay, so, so this is of order 10 kilometers per second, okay, as opposed to C, which is, uh, okay, you know what C is. But in simulations, yeah. what kind do you actually go to? Uh, in simulations, I go to uh, this factor of 300. 300? Yeah, well, separate. Yeah. Uh, and. When, yeah. You, when you say, um, our face, like when you said that earlier, that movie, Mach uh -huh. number of 30, uh -huh. um, the Mach number is of 30 means compared to a phase yeah. speed. Yes, that's our fa adding Mach number. Yeah. For the factor of 10 more um, speed for your pocket. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but these are different simulations, of course. That the before before it was a shock simulation for a different problem. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, right, and for this skill separation problem, I think MHD peak method just perfectly outperform any, any existing peak method. But even though uh, during the process, okay, I will also notice that recently there's also work by uh, Holcomb and Spikowski who actually used the traditional full peak uh, to study the streaming instability, which is actually very impressive. But they have to go through a C over V of 10, okay. Um, and actually, they are not really in the realistic regime of cosmic streaming. So there are a lot of other artifacts um, that they have to sacrifice. All right. So even when we do MHTP, there are additional challenges that we I was not imagine okay envisioning at the beginning. So one thing is that we're talking about uh, a situation where the particle distribution function is only very weakly an anisotropic. Uh, the situation we're looking at I means V D over C is much much less than one. And you're going to represent with your particle distribution. That means you need a huge number of particles per cell. Otherwise, you won't capture it. Uh, and our solution to this is that we implement a method called delta S method. So that it basically assumes that okay, you have some known exist, uh, ex initial equilibrium distribution F0. Okay. Uh, and as long as you're not going to deviate from F0 by too much, you can take the advantage that F0 is already analytically known so that you can uh, give a different interpretation of your particles. Instead of each particle represent one part of the distribution function, now you make your particle only represent the deviation from F0, which gives you a huge boost in the signal to noise. Uh, How many does it serve? Sorry? How many does it serve? Uh, I think this is standard plasma physics method. Yeah. That is well known since the 1990s. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there's another caveat, actually, uh, which is to do this, your F0 has to be a smooth distribution function. You cannot use a truncated power law, for instance. Okay, that's something. Uh, and so instead, so we used actually a kappa distribution, which has the same power law at higher energies, but it has smooth uh, uh, tra transition towards lower energies. And the second challenge that, again, I didn't anticipate at the beginning, uh, is that the pitch angle diffusion scattering of particles is due to a process called quasi linear diffusion. As basically, you have the wave scattering particles, and each you can uh, envisage this process as you have a, a series of independent wave packets, and each wave packet, after they pass through the particles, give it a random kick, and changes its pitch angle by a small amount. And this is, and eventually, the pitch angle will undergo a random walk. And so, the assumption, underlying assumption for this is that well, you have to encounter a bunch of independent wave packets. But if you use the periodic boundary condition, after your particles come back, you will see the same wave packets. And so that will no longer make pitch angle diffusion, uh, basically you no longer see pitch angle diffusion anymore. And uh, if you, okay, uh, and in order to make sure that you encounter sufficient amount of independent wave packet, you can estimate what your bulk size has to be. And it turns out that you have, this, so this is the resonant wavelength, you have to have Ni over Nci times the resonant wavelength, okay? And that, again, becomes a horrible thing. Um, and our solution is that every time a particle exits the box and return, we randomize its face. And that perfectly solves the problem, okay? Otherwise, we don't get the, uh, the growth rate right, actually. Uh, the gyro phase, okay, we, the gyro phase, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Not the direction, it's the same direction. V parallel, V parallel, V perp are the same, but just do, yeah, randomize the phase. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <coughs> right, right, right. And uh, okay, when you have all this implemented, we can very well reproduce the, okay, so this is our sort of a, a snapshot of the simulation of the, these are the V perp, uh, B perp, V perp. And we can decompose this into wave spectrum, okay? And you can further decompose into forward, left, forward, right, backward, left, backward, right. And we clearly see that forward traveling waves grow and backward traveling waves are damped, okay? And for typical parameters, we adopt VD is two times VA, NCR over N is 10 to minus four, and this, uh, this is basi basically the uh, 300, C over VA is 300, okay? Um, and, but, as normal statistic or you actually treat them as relativistic? We treat them as, yeah, we treat them as relativistic. So the lower speed of light, speed of light. We specify speed of light to be 300. 
Yeah. Well, the same, it's the same as keeping C but making VA bigger. Yes. Yeah. And OK, so we're using, actually, still we're using a huge number of particles, 2,000, uh, because we have to simulate the whole particle spectrum, energy spectrum. And each spectral being, you have, a, you have some ang angular representation of the particles. And here is the uh, growth rate versus measured growth rate versus analytical growth rate. And they uh, match uh, almost perfectly. So is this still a step where you're sending a wave into a wall, or is it? It's a periodic box. Just, just periodic? Just, yeah, it's just periodic. Yeah. yeah. So, so if BD is a half of VA, it just doesn't do anything? Sorry? Say, uh, so that VD is oh, okay. If it's hot, then nothing happens. The wave damp, actually. The wave damp. Yeah. yeah. And this is uh, just a. Uh, yeah, I did check that. I did check that. Yeah. And actually, if uh, you are still traveling in the positive uh, VD, say half of the uh, VA, then the forward traveling waves are damped uh, faster than backward traveling waves. If you do the opposite, then the other, the other way around. Yeah. And here is the uh, full movie, OK, and uh, towards saturation. So eventually, so re OK, let me do it again. Uh, initially, you are seeing the fastest growing mode. And at some point, they saturate. And this growth progresses towards longer and longer wavelengths, because those waves grow more slowly. OK, and so it takes longer for them to grow. And eventually, they saturate. And they, again, just process just progress towards longer. And eventually, this is our box size they cut off. What, what cuts off in that uh, this, this is great noise. Yeah. Any, any shocks here? Like very this is a very good point. I'll come back to that. Yeah. We don't understand how that happened. But this is actually important for particle scattering. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's saturated, okay, here is how they saturate. It's saturated by, of course, linear diffusion, okay. So here I'm plotting the uh, delta F over F, okay. Uh, I'm plotting it in the lab frame and in the wave frame. Um, so this is how, because as the wave e evolve, right, they also scatter particles. The particle distribution function also evolves. Uh, and this is, they are evolving according to this uh, quasi linear diffusion equation where they are, and this scattering frequency essentially determine, uh, describes that, uh, pitch angle scattering, OK? And it's proportional to the uh, wave intensity at the resonant uh, wavelengths. So uh, where does the randomization come from? Uh, it, it doesn't show up in this plot, yeah. yeah. But how does it affect it? It's like, when you randomize it, uh -huh. you try fiddling around with, you know, if you have a certain size box length, like, so you say mm -hmm. waves are decorrelated on the size of that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, first of all? <laughs> Uh, what, do, what do you mean by it? Well, you're putting in this randomization by hand. Yes. Every time the particles go over the length of the box. So you're assuming the waves are decorrelated mm -hmm. on the size of the box. Uh-huh. Is that true? Um, for the waves, it's probably not. Okay. But for particles, um, you know, okay, here I'm using a delta F method. A which? Delta F method. So delta F method actually helps again in this regard, because you are not really changing the weights any. Uh, I'm just trying to yeah. sort out, I mean, you're making this assumption that you can randomize the particle phases. Yes. Is, I mean, you're getting the right answer, so in some sense, maybe that's OK. Mm -hmm. but, but it seems like you're cheating, because there's nothing in the physics to randomize the phases of the particles. That's true. It is, uh, to some extent, it's a trick. It's, uh, but it seems to yield the right answer. Okay. Yes. For, for a different size bulk and see if you can get the same That's what I'm wondering, yeah. If you change that decorrelation length, like, does it, does it, does uh, it I've played with, yeah. Halfway across the box, does it make any more difference? Uh, I wouldn't think it will make any difference. Right. But yeah. in linear theory, this is stability, what matters is the distribution of particles, not in phase, but in the other components of the momentum. Um, well, in the linear theory, you have to go deal with that singularity, right? In the in the denominator, uh, and the way okay to, to go through that, you have to invoke that magic Landau integral. Yeah. And the physics behind that Landau integral actually is related to this phase random yeah, uh, this exactly. quasi linear diffusion. Right. right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> All right, so this is how particle distribution function evolves. 
because particle. No, no, no. Saturation happens because the waves isotropize the particles. And then you run out of free energy, so no, nothing can drive the wave growth anymore. Yeah. So we put it, so you F0 has the opposite sign of it. Then what happens? OK, so look at my, my color bar. OK, gray means 0. OK, and red means. So if you care about what the total distribution function is. Uh, the total distribution function is trivial. It's just a kappa distribution, right? And it's isotropic in. No, no, typically, typically in these, these types of streaming instabilities, the, the perturbation of the distribution function is isotropic in sign between forward and reverse. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you have to have an imbalance. <laughs> yeah, so, so in, in the lab frame, initially, particles are isotropic. But if you're in the wave frame, they are not. Right? And then uh, I'm pl plotting them both. Uh, and here is the scattering frequency. Okay, so this is, this is pitch angle. Okay, I should, okay, if don't, okay, this is pitch angle. This is backward traveling, forward traveling. Okay, and this is momentum. Okay? And our standard momentum, P0, is, is here. Okay, this is log P over P0. So P0 is here. Higher end higher energy particles, lower energy particles. Um, <coughs> as waves are excited, okay, it means this region can ex scatter particle more strongly. And you, you indeed see that a particle tries to get isotropized in both of these. But you see that particles here, they got stuck. Okay. They got stuck uh, at this 90 degree pitch angle mu equals zero. Okay. Uh, I will come back to this, okay, why they got stuck. Uh, but we do have simulations where they overcome this, okay? So 90 means... Uh, uh, okay, so they are gyrating just... Okay, this is magnetic field, they are gyrating... Yeah, 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 they're doing this, okay. Yes, like, yeah. You need to somehow reflect it, okay, yeah. Uh, um, so I'm doing... Okay, I think it's uh, normalized by this omega. Yeah. Okay, so Ki um, is in units of the uh, energy density. Okay. Basically, the integral of I over K uh, gives you the total wave energy density. Okay. But then, to what energy density do you normalize it? The uh, background. Magnetic energy density, yeah, yeah. All right. Then I do have a simulation where I boost this by a factor of 10. Before it's 10 to minus 4, now it's 10 to minus 3. Uh, <coughs> and here, now you see that they do cross. OK, they finally cross 90. And eventually, you see that particles in this momentum range, they isotropize. I mean, this, this is 0, OK? I mean, they fully isotropized. All right. Um, all right, so just from that simulation, you can measure the average drift velocity as a function of time, and eventually they all reduce to zero. Uh, and OK, now back, come, come back to this 90 degree problem, OK? Uh, the reason this is they, don't, they get stuck at 90 uh, degree pitch angle is that uh, when you have 90 degree, V parallels zero. <laughs> you are resonant with uh, basically zero wavelengths. Okay, there's no wave at that wavelength, and you get stuck. And so you have to, in order to scatter across 90 degrees, you have to invoke some nonlinear effect. Uh, one, that popular model uh, is mirror reflection. Uh, it relies on the fact that this magnetic moment uh, is an adiabatic invariant. OK, this p per square over b. OK, if you are traveling in a slowly varying magnetic field, this is sort of model for magnetic bottle you tend to reflect against regions where you have strong magnetic field. Okay, this is a well-known effect. And another solution uh, is called nonlinear wave particle interaction, which basically says that, okay, so this mirror reflection re relies on slowly varying field, meaning the field has to vary much slower than your gyro, uh, gyro time scale. But here is the other extreme, where if the field vary abruptly, okay, and much faster okay, than your gyro period, then you can also get reflected. For instance, if here, the field abruptly varies here. Uh, and if you run a particle uh, and if you can follow its trajectories, you find that you can get reflected. Okay. 
Um, so which one is correct? Right? And in our simulations, what we find is that we don't find mirror reflection. Actually, magnetic moment is not conserved because, of, because we see that there is rapid variation of field strength. And instead, okay, this is one typical reflection event, and this happens okay, at this location about 1,000, and at the particle travel at this location, you can see one component of the magnetic field abruptly changes. And so we conclude that this uh, reflection is by non uh, this nonlinear uh, wave particle interaction. Uh, all right, I'm almost running out of time, but basically we find that the uh, condition, the, the saturation, the saturated magnitude, as long as particles manage to cross 90 degrees, they are fully saturated, and the saturation amplitude is expected from coarse linear theory. Uh, and we can also look at the cosmic feedback, and so this is uh, as a function of time, right? The, as time goes on, gas momentum changes, and exactly the opposite way, as cosmic momentum, that means the, uh, there's moment, I mean, the cosmic momentum is eventually deposited into gas, and this is the main process that you can drive galactic wind, okay? Uh, and you can also look at the uh, uh, cosmic ray heating. Uh, actually, we found that it actually it doesn't directly heat, okay? This is the, uh, as a time, uh, time, okay, this is the uh, wave energy as a function of time, and over time, this is the wave amplitude actually dense because this is purely numerical. We have numerical dissipation. And that goes to the uh, internal energy. And so basically, there's no direct cosmic ray heating, but all the heating has to do with uh, wave dissipation, which is, uh, all right. Uh, so very briefly about future directions. Uh, these are just the initial simulations. We haven't put in any additional in particular, wave damping physics. There are three important damping physics that have been discussed in the literature. One is called ion neutral damping in partially ionized plasmas. And there is also the nonlinear Landau damping for the background plan and also turbulent damping. Uh, we, at the moment, we are um, investigating the first, which is the simplest way to do, because you just want to add a, uh, add a simple dissipation term, that's it. And once you have uh, ion neutral damping, what we find is that it's actually even more difficult to cross this 90 degree pitch angle, because you preferentially, uh, well, you, you, you damp all waves at all, um, at, at the same rates, but because uh, uh, <coughs> high frequency waves are, their, their growth rate is lower, and so that actually you get much smaller power at smaller scales, and you are even more difficult to do this. So it suppresses this instability and in exchange of momentum. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just more difficult to, to uh, in, uh, excite this instability or to stop the cosmic from escaping. Uh, and, uh, and also it leads to a situation where the distribution function is no longer isotropic relative to any frame. That means the uh, assumption that made in the cosmic transport equation is no longer hold, no longer holds here. So if this oh. were really the story, then you wouldn't have this, they would just stream out of the galaxy. Probably, probably. We are not uh, we are still working on this at the moment. Yeah. Well most of the volume of is in hot gas, right? Uh, yes, there are yes, different of course different phases of ISM, there are different damping mechanisms. We are gonna uh, at the moment, we're just doing ion neutral. This yeah. does sound like a classic story that the cosmic rays don't push very well on, on GMCs. It's possible, yes. Yeah. 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 Hmm. That's always a claim, I guess. Yeah. Most, of the, most of the gas you see going out of the galaxies is actually that hot. Well, the Milky Way sounds like clear. Yeah. And we're also running some two dimensional simulations. Uh, this is much more expensive. Uh, <coughs> But so this is the rho, temperature, three components of magnet. This is the background component, the uh, longitudinal component. These are the two transverse components. Uh, it's a very preliminary. It's just, we just, I just have this one single wrong. But later, I do see the development of some oblique structures. But this may be uh, artificial due to the shape of the box. But you do seem to excite some oblique uh, structures. This is two. Or this is two D, two D streaming explosive simulation. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay, so let me uh, stop here by just uh, leaving uh, the summary points. And thank you very much. <laughs> uh -huh. It will 
it's going to the, uh, well, if it's fully saturated, yes, then it will go to the affine speed. Oh, so yeah. your plot, I thought, said it was going to zero. Oh, sorry, I think I'm plotting VD minus VA. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, going back to your plot on the heat and the okay. heat transfer, um, you said that you have a range of temperatures. So, the, the red line is direct interactions? Oh, 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 oh you, you, mean, you mean this one? Yeah. Okay, so so okay, so the green is the internal energy, okay. which increases over time. But that's all due to the fact that I first have waves excited, uh -huh. then these waves are damped numerically in the simulation, okay. and so that internal the, the code conserves energy very well. And so, how does this wave heating compare to Okay. Uh, okay, so so this is the ideal MHD simulation. I'm not in, assuming any. Fee Yes, that's uh, what we're working on the, for the ion neutral damping case. Yeah, so this is the idealized simulation. We just want to try to make it work, which take me five years, okay? Yeah, there's no, yeah, this, okay. this is purely numerical. Okay. Yeah, but it demonstrates that, yes, the heating has to be wave heating, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.